Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Declan Croucher, and I work with, uh, with Verite. I've been asked to speak to you briefly this afternoon, just before lunch, on uh, implementing and verifying employer pays ethical recruitment, and talk a little bit about some of the projects and tools and approaches that we've been, uh, we've been working on. Um, for those who may not be familiar with, with Verite, we're a labor rights, <coughs> excuse me, civil society organization. We've been in existence since 1995. Uh, we're headquartered in the east coast of the US, but we've got a, a global footprint. And we work across sectors, uh, across regions. We work with governments. We work with other civil society organizations, multinational companies, suppliers, unions, worker organizations. Essentially, any individuals or entities who are in earnest about addressing and improving social performance in supply chains and mitigating risks to workers. We do uh, research, we do consulting, training, policy advocacy. Uh, we also do um, on the ground uh, risk assessments, investigations on labor rights uh, issues. We work on the full range of labor rights, but we're probably best known for our work on some of the more intractable issues like forced labor, child labor, but we also do a lot of work on ethical recruitment, discrimination, and, and other issues. Okay, so for, uh, for this audience and those, those watching online, I'm, I'm sure this is not a particularly novel uh, or, or new statement. Employer pays is a, a cornerstone of ethical recruitment. From our perspective, what we mean by that is uh, we believe that there really needs to be an express enforceable obligation on employers to pay the full and true costs of recruitment in their operations and supply chains. It's just not good enough to have a no fees to workers policy, right? Somebody has to pay those costs. Right? We all know that there are identifiable, quantifiable, legitimate, and necessary costs associated with moving workers transnationally to take up employment in countries outside uh, their home countries. And the simple fact of the matter is, if the employer doesn't pay those costs as a cost of doing business, who else do we think is gonna pay for them? There's really only one constituency left that's uh, willing to pay, and, and that's workers, right? So there needs to be this parallel obligation um, on, on employers to, to pay these costs and to factor those in to their cost of goods co sold or the services that they are providing. Um, I was struck by uh, Rakesh's uh, register earlier, uh, where there's significant progress in terms of companies with um, no fees to workers policies, but when it, came to, uh, when it came to actually employer pays obligations, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was around 10%. Uh, and that's not a world away from our experience uh, implementing programs in supply chains. Somewhere in the five to 10% range of employers in high risk migration corridors, in our view, are effect effectively implementing uh, employer pays. In addition to having a policy, of course, uh, it, it's important to, to assess and verify its implementation, right? If, if these issues could have been resolved with the stroke of a pen, we probably wouldn't be here at this conference. We would have solved this issue uh, decades ago. Um, so human rights due diligence interventions, whether it's screenings, self-assessment questionnaires, whether it's audits, uh, or other forms of uh, uh, engagement, in our view, employer pays needs to be verified, but you cannot simply assume that it will be, it will be implemented. Uh, that's in addition to ensuring, of course, that, that workers are not, uh, are not charged, right? Because we want to avoid the scenario of double dipping. What, what do I mean when I say employer pays verification? The, the approach that, that, that we take at least, uh, and I, I know there are others that, that do something similar, Essentially, it means identifying the recruitment pathways. So how do workers arrive at the workplace or the work site in the, in the first instance? Were they recruited directly from their country of origin? Were there third-party uh, private recruitment agents involved in 
origin and destination countries, or only in one country? Uh, were the workers already in the country of destination? Perhaps they're transferring from an employer, a work visa or a permit has expired, and they're able to change employers. Perhaps they are, and we heard reference to it earlier, perhaps they're undocumented, they've been regularized through a program like the Labor Recalibration Scheme in Malaysia or equivalent programs in other jurisdictions. So understanding how the workers got there is obviously the first step. Second step is mapping the cost of ethical recruitment. So once we know how workers are getting to the site, what are those costs um, that, that ought to be paid by an employer who is uh, seeking to implement ethical, ethical recruitment? If there are agents involved, uh, clearly understanding the nature of their involvement and their role is critical. So part of what we do is we look at everything from foreign worker quotas, block visas where they exist, we look at demand letters, powers of attorney, we look at employer agreements with agents. So we're assessing the nature of the financial and contractual relationship between the employer and those third parties who are involved in recruiting workers. So that's the kind of the mapping portion or section of it. Secondarily then, you want to compare that against what has actually happened. So you, an employer may have a quota for you know, 200 workers from Nepal, but they may, only, they may only recruit 175 or 180. But determining what workers were recruited through what pathways, uh, and then essentially verifying, it's like a mini, um, uh, it's like a mini financial audit determining did the employer do what they said they were going to do? Did they, did they pay those costs? And it's not just a question of looking at invoices or receipts. We're looking, we're certainly looking at those. We're also looking to see that the funds actually were transferred to those entities. Again, I, I'm sure it's not gonna surprise the attendees at this conference and those who are logged in online that most of these risks occur or materialize when you're talking about um, uh, recruitment agents and, and third party intermediaries and other costs that occur in the workers' country of origin. So we're particularly looking at payments that are made to entities in the workers' country of origin, either to pay them for their professional services uh, or to reimburse them for those legitimate and necessary costs, uh, whether that's medical examinations, pre-departure orientation, exit visas, uh, uh, insurance contrib contributions, and so on. So it's essentially closing that, um, closing that loop. Why, why do we do this? It's very granular, um, and, and there's a number of reasons, some of which have already been alluded to uh, by other speakers this morning, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip over those. I've already mentioned there are identifiable, quantifiable costs. So for each worker pathway in each migration corridor, within a range, we can estimate what an ethical employer uh, is gonna end up paying, right? That can be factored into planning, that can be used in uh, negotiations with third-party recruitment agents. Uh, this was also mentioned in particular by the speakers in the last panel. We have to be honest about this. Um, employers are incentivized to avoid many of these costs, particularly in competitive, low margin sectors where there's a high reliance on manual labor. Moving workers from countries A to B is, is expensive, it's time consuming. Most of these workers are on the equivalent of guest worker visas. While some will renew uh, their, their work visas, there will be significant churn and turnover. So these costs recur as you recruit subsequent cohorts of workers. And the impact on the direct labor cost can be significant. So for certain employers, there's just an inherent incentive to try and avoid these costs, to, to blame others for, um, uh, for charging workers when they themselves are not necessarily uh, paying what, what, what they ought to be. What we do know is when the employer doesn't pay these costs, uh, whether they avoid them or turn a blind eye, those costs will be inflated by unscrupulous intermediaries and passed on to workers, exposing them, obviously, to, to debt-bonded labor. Um, that's relatively straightforward. From our perspective, uh, and again, I know many other organizations share this, uh, certainly 
in our experience, working on labor migration um, for a couple of decades now, we see an extremely close correlation between the employer not paying the full and true cost of ethical recruitment and those costs then being inflated and passed on to workers. It's even, it's even down to the level where employers don't pay enough right, to compensate, for example, an agent for their services that those agents invariably will charge workers, right? They'll, ma they'll make up the difference. So if the employer isn't paying, and by the way, imposing the type of controls that are necessary to ensure that workers aren't charged, that's what's basically going to happen. Um, one of the other reasons we, we do this is to shift the burden um, of reporting uh, fee payments from workers to, to employers. Uh, again, we heard this referred to earlier uh, in, in, in the session. Workers are of, often threatened um, uh, not to disclose what they've paid. They're fearful, right? These workers are on guest worker um, visas, right? A debt bonded worker's greatest fear is that she's going to lose that job, right? Because her debt is held at home. If she loses that job, she's not going to be able to repay the debt at home. She'll probably be blacklisted as a troublemaker and be unable then to remigrate to service that debt. So workers are under enormous pressure not to disclose, particularly when they know there's audits, assessments, investigations coming. This is one way to spread that evidentiary burden by determining upfront whether the employer has paid these costs or not. Now, it's not foolproof, but it is one way to triangulate uh, when you're looking at, at these issues. Uh, it also mitigates the risk of, of, of what's known as double dipping. I'm sure everybody in, the, uh, in, in, in attendance here knows what I mean by that. But that's where unscrupulous third parties, in addition to being paid by an employer, also seek to charge workers, right? So they're not just being paid by the employer, they're also trying to char charge workers. The reason we say it mitigates that risk is if you've got an employer who's paying the full and true cost now, um, now they've got essentially skin in the game. They've got a vested interest, they've paid a significant amount of money. We're now going from a situation where, you know, don't ask, don't tell, to my workers are being charged, I've already paid for this service, right? We're getting into the realm essentially of recruitment fraud. And most, most companies having paid the type of money that they're gonna to pay to recruit workers won't, won't countenance that. Human nature being what it is, you probably will have to weed out bad apples to begin with. Um, you will get those that double dip, but over time uh, that should reduce. Um, and we also like the, the approach because there's multiple use cases. Certainly it can be part of your compliance, monitor, your compliance uh, 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 auditing regime, right? This can easily be done on site, but it can also be done, uh, it can be done remotely. It can be done easily um, through screenings. It can be used for continuous monitoring. There was a question to Keelan, I think it was earlier, uh, about you know, what, what changes did you make after the fact, uh, having gone through remediation. Monitoring whether employers have now begun to pay these costs is one way uh, uh, to continuously monitor whether, whether practices have changed. Okay, so I'm going to change tack slightly now and talk about a couple of um, uh, tools that we've developed, projects that we're involved in that may be of, of interest to you. These are more focused on the preventative side. Uh, as opposed to remediation, so tools that seek to you know, embed ethical or responsible recruitment in, in supply chains. The first one that I want to mention is um, our uh, newly launched recruitment cost calculator. Uh, this is a project we worked on. It was funded by uh, the Walmart Foundation. It's basically an open access tool that's designed to bridge the gap between a commitment to uh, employer pays ethical recruitment and, and actually implementing, okay? So one of the things that we, and I, I'm sure many others hear frequently is, you know, where can we get reliable information about the actual cost uh, of, of ethically recruiting uh, mi migrant workers? Um, so this is one contribution to that. Um, 
It was launched in the last week. We're starting with a small number of corridors, Mexico and Guatemala into the US, Nepal to Malaysia, we'll be, we'll be adding Bangladesh to Malaysia, and then later uh, this year, we will be adding uh, uh, migration corridors from South Asia to, um, uh, into, into, into Jordan. So the idea here is that this provides a baseline estimate to employers and stakeholders of what it costs to uh, ethically recruit migrant workers in, in those corridors. Uh, the way in which, it, sorry, I should have said, by the way, please feel free to, to access either uh, via the QR code here, the site, uh, or you can go to the, the Verite site and access um, uh, recruitment cost calculator. It's been launched on what we call a first look basis, so we would love people's feedback. Please go to the site, interact with it, leave us some feedback. Um, if there are organizations in the room here in particular who are interested in uh, contributing data or being part of the validation, please please see me over the course of the next couple of days. I'd be happy to connect you with the, uh, the, project, uh, the project team. But the way in which it works is users would identify the country of, of destination, the sector, uh, the region, uh, and the recruitment channel that, that they're proposing to use, and identifying the, the country of origin of the, uh, of, 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 of the workers. Um, you just hit calculate, and it's going to generate this list of fees broken up by country, category, and, and line item. Right? With, many of them are within a range. Okay? Uh, the information has been sourced uh, through direct research, through engagement with uh, employers, recruitment agencies, trade bodies, worker organizations, uh, amongst others. Uh, this will be continuously updated, uh, and so we w welcome uh, your, your input and engagement uh, on, this, uh, uh, on, you know, on this project. Okay. The next one that I want to mention uh, briefly is our Cumulus Forced Labor screen platform that, that some may be familiar with. This is a screening platform that remotely maps labor supply chains from countries of destination back to workers, countries of origin, and assesses the practices of employers and their recruitment agents against the, the ILO forced labor uh, indicator framework. Uh, a couple of years ago, we added functionality to it so that it, it also verifies whether employers that are screened via the platform are effectively implementing employer pays. So it's essentially incorporated or uh, integrated into the, the, the screening tool. Now, I'm showing you this. It doesn't need to be done just via Cumulus. This is just one of the ways in which we are doing it. Uh, but essentially, employers that are screened are, are required, in addition to providing workforce characteristics and demographic information and their recruitment channels, they're also required to disclose the recruitment fees and costs that they have paid in the country of destination as well as in the workers' country of origin, whether they've paid those directly or whether they have reimbursed third parties such as their duly appointed recruitment agents for those. Uh, the particular costs that they're asked to disclose are customized, obviously, to the specific countries and migration corridors, uh, but they're not just asked to declare what they've, they've paid. We, we also ask them to essentially provide proof or evidence and, and demonstrate that they have paid those. So they're required to upload many of the, the documents that I referred to uh, earlier uh, uh, in, in that, that sort of employer pays verification slide that I showed you. So it's not just indications of the, the number of workers that they've recruited broken out by time period, but also the specific fees and costs they've paid to government agencies, third party recruitment agents, and they're asked to uh, upload uh, documentation to, to, uh, to, you know, to verify that. And, and our analysis of that then gets included in the, uh, the screening report that, um, that is, is, is provided. Um, those verified employer 
payments then form part of uh, the assessment of risk of those screened entities against the ILO forced labor indicators and determines either recommendations that are made for, uh, for remediation, enhanced due diligence if necessary, or uh, additional capacity building. Again, if you use the, um, uh, the, the QR code here, you can uh, learn more about that particular tool and get a, a short automated demo on the, uh, on the website. The final project then that I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, this was funded by the uh, uh, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor at the US State Department. This is our FACT project, uh, fostering fee accountability and cost tracking. So this is ensuring that uh, worker-driven fee data gets included in the conversation, whether it's from a preventative perspective or from a uh, remediation perspective. So this particular project was designed to engage grassroots civil society organizations uh, based in India and Bangladesh who were um, working with migrants going to, in the case of India, to the Gulf Cooperation Council region, in the case of Bangladesh, workers going to Malaysia specifically, uh, but who were already working on safe migration inter interventions. And there were three basic objectives to this project. Uh, one was to build awareness amongst uh, 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 prospective job seekers about the risks associated with paying recruitment fees and related costs, uh, vulnerability to debt bonded labor, but also building their awareness um, around employer pays and the fact that there are a growing number of employers who are, are seeking to ensure that workers don't have to, uh, don't have to pay. Um, but also, we wanted to help strengthen the, the data collection and advocacy capabilities of those grassroots organizations working uh, within their communities uh, to collect and, and report on this fee data. Right? The logic being the earlier we can gather that information uh, in the recruitment journey, uh, the, uh, the greater the value it has. Right? If we're doing it exclusively after it's been discovered when workers have arrived in the country of destination, um, you know, the passage of time, memories fade, uh, and, and as, as we discovered this morning, uh, you know, having to remediate uh, is, is complicated, expensive, time-consuming, right? Uh, an ounce of prevention uh, is much, much better. Third objective then was to uh, contribute to, you know, just evidence-based interventions in the area specifically around prevention building awareness, and, and to a slightly lesser extent, uh, remedy. Um, okay. Because engaging workers around issues related to fee payments that they made, asking who they made these payments to, how much they borrowed, who they borrowed from, um, you know, the interest rates at which they borrowed, you know, they're obviously difficult topics, they're sensitive topics. For workers that have not yet deployed, they can often be reluctant to disclose that for fear that they won't be able to, uh, to depart and take up those jobs. So for that reason, the, um, you know, the project deployed a, a digital survey tool via the, uh, the Good Work app, but used it um, uh, as an extension of existing or ongoing interventions on safe migration. So this wasn't simply gathering information on fee payments uh, from workers in, in, in isolation. It was disseminating information to them, uh, but also gathering information from them throughout, the, um, uh, uh, throughout their, their recruitment journey. Um, some of the, and, and you, can, you can access a lot more information about the project on the project page on our website. You can use the QR code here. The team interviewed in a relatively short period of time about 600 workers across four, four countries and gathered you know, very detailed um, and, and specific 
information, not just the total amounts paid, but uh, where, where practical, uh, the breakdown of the discrete individual fees and categories as well as the entities, uh, the nature of the entities to whom these fees were paid. So key learning certainly for us from, from this was that it is uh, possible, it is practical, it, is, um, uh, it can be done efficiently to in, involve uh, worker-centric data upfront. We think there's a lot of potential uh, in, in using an approach like this um, as an early warning system, right? As employers transition to uh, an employer pays recruitment model, right? We talked earlier about uh, bad apples, but you know, being able to monitor the implementation of that throughout the recruitment journey, not not just after workers have arrived uh, on you know, on site, when it, it it is obviously difficult uh, to to remediate. Um, so, but please, yeah, a um, lot more information there um, uh, on, on the website. Uh, access it at your, uh, at your convenience. For those in the room, I'll be here for the balance questions. How long do we have? <laughs> okay. So, the, the, I mean, the answer to the first question is um, yes. In, 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 in certain circumstances, it is possible to identify, uh, you know, where those where those fees, um, where where those costs go, um, and um, in, in terms of individual entities, um, uh, I, you know, as well as. Um, uh, government agencies, and it was alluded to on more than one occasion this morning. Uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are endemic issues around corruption associated with um, cross-border labor migration, and that is a huge, huge, huge issue. Uh, so, um, so the answer to that question is yes. The second question then was, sorry, could you, re how can we, Declan, the second question is, how can we do social audits a lot better to identify recruitment fees? Um, well, I mean, I, I certainly would suggest uh, employer pays verification is one, is one way, right? Uh, it is, it's, it's, you're, 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 it's preventative. So if you can identify whether the employer has paid those fees or fees and costs or not, right, that's going to be a very valid indicator of whether workers have, you know, have paid or not. Right? The, it, it doesn't guarantee that they haven't, but it is a valid and reliable predictor of whether they, um, uh, you know, whether, whether they have or not. Uh, social audits right, are, are obviously challenging for a whole host of, of, of reasons. Some of, I'm not necessarily suggesting this is easy to do, but a lot of employer pays verification. You don't necessarily need an audit, you know, to do that. Right? You could actually do that in a supplier meeting. Uh, you could do it. Rem you can do it remotely. It can. It can be done. It, it's it's one approach, particularly to the issue of recruitment fees and related costs. And, and the reason for that is simply cross-border labor migration is, is heavily regulated. There's a paper trail. There's a money trail. You either paid it or you didn't, and we can identify those costs within within a reasonable range. So I don't want to stand between um, everybody and lunch, and I'm being told here by Neil to close. So I realize that's a short and kind of trite response, but it's it's one one answer. No, thank you for fitting in two questions in two minutes. That was amazing. So I don't have any more. Neil, should I give you? Thank you, Declan, for that, um, that uh, presentation.